Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Today we have the third class of being Muslim. We are all the way into obligations of prayer, fiqh of salat today. Um, this is a reason why we've spent um, a couple weeks coming in, for one. Uh, last week we covered the purification, the tahara, fiqh tahara, um, which is the primary obligation leading up to the prayer. Um, obviously there's a couple other things that it's important for, um, probably the most important of which would be for reading the Mustaf, uh, the Quran in the Arabic language, right? Uh, but prayer is the primary application that we have five day, eight times a day. We just finished Maghrib here, uh, alhamdulillah. And uh, we're going to dive into this today. Our, our first class that we had is the kind of introductory overview of the science of fiqh and Islamic sciences is actually very important for this today because when we're talking about prayer, specifically in terms of the fiqh of one madhab, you will notice there are going to be things that are left out. It's impossible to cover this in the time we have before Isha uh, and mention absolutely everything. Um, I did my best to compile as much as we could in this time. I, I think I might say kind of like I did in the first one. It, if you can withhold questions until the end, it might be best, but I'll probably be lax on that as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, let's jump in. I, I will try to branch out into the other schools of thought, but we th this book that we have, the Being Muslim book, is primarily focused on talking about things from the perspective of the madhab of Imam Malik, Ibn Anas, um, which is the, the Amul uh, of Medina, the city of the Prophet. Um, there will be noticeable differences between his methodology and the methodology, say, of Abu Hanifa, uh, the Hanafi Madhab, and Imam Shafi, um, Shafi Madhab. Um, and I'll try to point out some of the differences as we go along. Um, but if you're seeing something and you're like, wait, I feel like this should be here and you're not mentioning it, um, expect that it's going to be a Madhab to Madhab difference. Again, for the most part, when we're just talking about obligations, it's going to cover everything. They're all going to be the same. Um, there are some points where I'm going to need to go into some sunnas today and a few other things as well. Um, in the book, it doesn't really differentiate. You might have noticed that as you were reading. It's about 20 pages in chapter 3 that cover prayer, and it doesn't differentiate too much between what is a sunnah, what is a fard, what is a uh, fadila, a recommended thing. Um, so that'll be primarily what I'm distinguishing between today, just so that we have what is the bare minimum expectations um, to make a valid salah. Okay? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Even those who live in the presence of your Lord are not too proud to worship him. They glorify him and bow down before him. This is from the Quran. Um, so at 7, I see 106. I thought this was a good thing. They used this as one of the uh, chronic passages in the Being Muslim book in the chapter on worship, and it, it really references uh, heavily what we'll talk about today, not just worship in general. Um, one of the things here mentioned, the bowing down. That is the, the raku, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, there are other steps as well. And all of these, if you remember when we were talking about primary sources, when we were looking at wudu, the basic obligations are things that are primary source just from the Quran. Imam Malik tends to take the same um, methodology when he's looking at the prayer. The primary aspects of what it is to hold a valid prayer are going to be primarily just sourced from the Quran itself. When you add in the sunnahs, then you that's the hadith, of course, the literature, and then the practices that came down through the, the school of Medina. Uh, you'll, we'll have even more, but um, just something important to, to note as we go in. The conditions for salah. Um, 
there are three compulsory conditions, the first of which is being a mukallaf. Who can remember what a mukallaf is? Yes. Someone who is forgiven for previously. Yeah, what else? And they have the same one. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, there's three things. So a mukallaf is one who has uh, reached the age of maturity, it's puberty, um, who is of a sound mind, that's right, and has received word of Islam. They have received the dawah. Uh, so as long as those three conditions have happened, whether they're Muslim or not, they are considered a mukallaf. Okay? Oh. Yeah. Whether they're Muslim or not? Whether they're Muslim or not. Having received news of Islam makes you a makalif. That's one who is incumbent to do uh, to do the obligations. Okay? Yeah. That's just a review back from uh, our previous classes. So, mukalaf is important. <clears throat> Being a Muslim, that's added for, for this. Okay? Um, if you are not a Muslim, you're not obligated to pray. Uh, because you have not entered into Islam. You have not given your shahada. Alhamdulillah, my wife and I got to um, be witnesses to a shahada just the other day. Uh, it was a very special thing. And um, this is one of the, the things. is Now that you become a Muslim, now you have this obligation upon you of prayer. So learning that, like we are doing today in this class, just going over a review. It, and this is as much a review for myself as it is a reminder for all of you. Um, but being a Muslim, this this is that first step that, that they're just talking about. You're one who has, uh, whether you're a convert or whether you're born Muslim, um, that born Muslim kind of wraps into the Makalif thing once you hit puberty. But for those who are converts, that's an important step. Now you are required to perform uh, the Salah regularly. Okay. Um, and and that, that's an important thing to keep in mind because it, as we talked about before, since Salah is obligatory, if you miss a Salah, you do have to make repentance, the Tawbah for that. So you do have to make that Salah up. So knowing when you make your Shahada is an important thing, because then if you do miss them, you can track it along with that. And oh, it's an important thing. Yeah. What before the Shahada is not? No, nothing. it's nothing. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you mean entrance or the time of prayer? Yeah, that's our third condition, the entrance of the time of prayer. So, for example, we just had Maghrib, right? That's the entrance of the time of the Maghrib Salah. And that occurs at a specific time of day. Um, there are five different prayer times and they are all distinguished by a certain time. And we'll break that down here in a moment. Clinicians for the validity, the wudu. We just covered, covered the tahara, uh, all of the purification rites um, just last week. Um, and alhamdulillah, we have these on recording if you want to. Uh, go back and review or anything or all that. Um, facing the Qibla is another aspect of the validity. We always know when we come into the masjid, alhamdulillah, there's going to be a niche or a mark um, or a direction pointing us to the Qibla. That's, that's the direction of the Kaaba. Alhamdulillah. That's a good thing. And we'll, we'll go into that because that is something that can have a little bit of a disagreement. And how do you find the Qibla if you're not at the masjid and things like that. Um, covering one's arwa. Um, one's, one's nakedness, right? Um, this is an important uh, element of the validity of the Salah. Um, avoiding speech, and then also avoiding unnecessary movements. These are also things that are important. Um, so if, if you're the one, say, who's behind the Imam, um, you shouldn't be excessively talking. You shouldn't be greeting yeah. in the middle of Salams another brother who comes up next to you. You can save that for after the Salah. Um, thing with the unnecessary movements. Don't go out and give them a hug or anything during the Salah. Wait, wait until that's over. Stay focused in your Salah. Okay? So there's three of these that I'm going to break down into more detail. Um, Johannes, you're correct there in talking about the time of prayer. Uh, I think that's the first one I started with. Um, yeah, the time of Salah. How do we track time? Can you guys tell me that? With a watch? Yeah? With an app. With an app? Yeah? Looking outside, like the old people. Good, mashallah. That, that's the sunnah. That's the yeah. correct way to do it, is actually looking outside um, and seeing it with your eyes. 
uh, there's a hadith. We'll look into this more next week when we talk about the fasting. Um, but there are numerous hadiths about how uh, we are not to do any of these actions like prayer and fasting unless we have sighted, witnessed it ourselves um, in the skies that it, it's the time to come in. Uh, so having yakin, certainty that the time has come in, is uh, it, it's both a compulsory condition and it's a condition of the validity as well. So it falls under both aspects. Okay. Uh, this is actually I got two stories on this. Um, I'll share one this week and I'll share another one next week actually. So um, three years ago, four yeah three years ago, um, I was in uh, Spokane. Uh, Washington, Eastern Washington uh, during Ramadan uh, and uh, the brothers are coming in early it's just about time to break your fast and uh, the muazzin goes up and starts calling the adan and some of the brothers are like oh yay grab my water have a sip grab a date things like that we like to do right and the imam comes in about uh, as he's finishing the adan goes right up to the muazzin grabs him by the shoulder and says, I just came in. I can see the sun still in the sky. SubhanAllah. Uh, and yeah, it was actually about five minutes too early, him calling the Adhan. So um, having having true Yaqeen, instead of just referencing, oh, this is what uh, a timesheet said, this is what an app said, things like that, is actually very important. I'll, I'll give another story next week, but that was one that I witnessed that was really uh, kind of a dramatic, important moment. Because that, that can actually... Um, jeopardize other brothers in their fast for that day. They have to then make that fast up because they broke their fast early. Um, and that, that's not something that we want. So having yakin, the certainty of it is very important. And most of the scholars actually say if to have the yakin, we should delay things two to three minutes is a recommended thing. Um, just, just for that. To be sure. Just to be sure that the time has actually come in. Yeah. So, um, so when we're talking about the times of the Salah, there's two terms that the scholars use. These are ikhtiyari and dhururi. And the ikhtiyari is taking the example of the Quran of um, being punctual in your time, praying it exactly as soon as it comes in. And there's usually a window uh, of that time that you're, you're um, being a good, proper Muslim in a way and you're just coming in and doing the best you can to make it in as soon as the time comes in. The Dharuri time is a what you could almost call like a grace period, where it's still valid for you to perform the Salah, uh, and, and you're not getting a sin for doing it, but it's not as punctual as it could have been. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is actually a little maybe a bit more of a better explanation. Um, the Ithiyari is the preferred time for the prayer, yeah. Um, within which everyone is obligated to pray unless there is a valid excuse. So yeah, generally you need a valid excuse to pass it on and delay the Salah, right? Um, <clears throat> for the Dururi, the time in which the prayer is still within time, but it's not the preferred time. And it's uh, not permissible to delay an obligatory prayer beyond its Ithiyari time to the Dururi time without a valid excuse. Uh, and if you are delaying it without a valid excuse, then that is generally considered to be a sin. This here is a chart that uh, my teachers put together that breaks down the Salat times. And when you're looking into the, well, it's more detailed than even um, the Salat uh, al Ashmawiya that we're, we're setting here for the Arabic text. Um, like if you're looking at the Musa uh, Khalil and things like that, uh, it's going to go into way more details uh, and give this kind of a breakdown for you. So th this is what's considered to be the uh, the ijma, the consensus opinion in the Maliki Matem for when the times come in. And that would start with the Duhr time. Um, so Duhr starts when the sun starts to decline from its zenith. So once midday hits and it starts to surpass that is when Duhr comes in. It's not precisely at midday, it's just after midday. Um, <clears throat> and, and that's kind of another reason as to why I was just saying, uh, it's recommended to delay a few minutes after the coming in of the time, um, just to make sure that it actually has surpassed the zenith of midday, inshallah. Uh, and then for the Ithiyari time there, that for Dilkar goes until mid-afternoon, which 
according to a hadith, as where this is calculated from, uh, by adding the length of an object plus the length of its shadow. This is different in the madhab of uh, Imam uh, Abu Hanifa. And if you guys are ever over uh, on, in Beaverton, uh, you may be familiar with Bilal Masjid. Uh, Bilal Masjid itself practices the Hanafi madhab. So if you ever go there and you're, you're expecting to go for the time of Asr, they'll probably pray it at least an hour to an hour and a half later than the time uh, that we would be expecting. Okay? Just, just something to be aware of. Wonderful masjid. Love the brothers there. Um, and they practice uh, another valid an opinion. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa actually took a different opinion of how he was um, uh, interpreting that hadith along with another hadith as well. Um, so, um, the Asr then comes in and at mid-afternoon, as calculated. And um, so actually where it's talking there of when the Ithbiyari time for Asr is over, that's actually when the time Abu Hanifa calls it coming in. So the Asr time is actually very short in the Hanafi Madhab. Um, <clears throat> and then those go until sunset, which is when the Maghrib then comes in, right? Yo. Yeah, so sunset is our sign for Maghrib coming in. Um, and an important thing to note is that when the time, when, when you have the sun actually in its setting phase, it is actually haram to pray. Same within the morning, when the sun is actually rising up, that time is haram to pray as well. Uh, there's the only two times it's haram to pray. Um, after Asr, it's also considered to be haram to pray unless it's making up for Salah. Uh, you can make up Salah during that time too if you have missed Salah, so you need to make up. Uh, but yeah, during uh, the rising, it's about a eight minute window usually of when the sun is there sinking and then rising up from the horizon. Right? Um, so yeah, Maghrib comes in at the sunset and then the time between Maghrib and when Isha comes in is actually fairly brief. We're, we're only giving ourselves about an hour, hour and 15 minutes or so um, here at the masjid. Um, and that, that's, that's approximately correct. So that, that if the Ari time is roughly 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so Maghrib is very fast. Um, when, when we're doing the, the prayers and the Adhan, uh, just, there's just a recommended things on Maghrib. It's always recommended to do them faster. Uh, like the brother today, he was reciting some of the, the shorter surahs. That's a recommended thing for Maghrib because it, it's window is so short. Yeah. Um, same with the Adan, if, you, uh, if you're uh, hearing the Adans at different times, you'll notice the Maghrib Adan is always the shortest one. They, they speed through it often. Um, so, uh, once the redness of the sky has disappeared, that's uh, when the time for the Maghrib has surpassed and Isha is coming in. Uh, it, it's actually a little bit before for when the darkness comes uh, in, in the, the Maliki Medhev. Uh, in other Medhevs, Isha comes in a little bit later. Uh, it comes in earliest, I believe, in our Medhev. Uh, and then the night is divided into segments. This is not calculated time-wise, necessarily, in terms of, oh, hours, uh, one after two hours, three hours, etc. cetera. Um, but again, this, and this will change seasonally. So if, for example, tonight uh, Isha is coming in roughly around 8.40 or so, right? Yeah. Um, and then we have Fajr coming in at about 5.30? Five about 5.30, yeah. yeah. So from, I'll round it down, 8.30, since we're, we're talking it coming in a little earlier here, 8.30 to 5.30, that's how many hours? 8.30 to 5.30, it's nine hours. nine hours. So if we divide our nine hours in thirds, then the first third of the night, first three hours from 8.30 until 11.30 is your Ithiyari time for the Isha. Okay? Does that make sense? And then who knows about what's important in the last third of the night? Yeah, Tiyajum, Lailat Kayum, yeah. 
um, that last third of the night then, so from 2.30 to 5.30, is also a very special time for Nuafal prayers, the supererogatory prayers, right? Your extra Sunnah prayers, waking up for Tahajud, um, putting in any extra time you can. Uh, it, any, um, any act, whether it's prayer, whether it's reading Quran, or whether it's just making dua, dhikr, anything is recommended during that time, that last third. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, good. And then the Subbah prayer. So in the Maliki Madhab, Fajr is not called Fajr. Uh, it's called Subbah. Um, Fajr is actually the Sunnah prayer before the uh, What prayer is the not fart. you said? Um, what was that? What was the thing you said again about prayer that is not compulsory? Not compulsory? Yeah. Um, what prayer do you say? Nuwafal. Nuwafal. Yeah. That that's a supererogatory. It's extra prayers. Oh, okay. Yeah, that you make. Not not the fards of Isha, Maghrib, Dhuhr, Asr. Right, right, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, so terminology wise, as I was just explaining, the 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 twilight, uh, the pre dawn prayer, uh, in the Maliki Medhib is called Subah. Um, the Sunnah before the fard is called Fajr. Yeah, just just for clarification, because I'll be using those terms. Um, so the Subha prayer, uh, when the dawn, the first light of dawn appears, um, is is when you can start praying it, and it's usually good to pray the <clears throat> the Fajr then or the the Sunnah prayer as soon as it comes in, and uh, then to wait roughly. I think we, brothers here that come in usually rock wait around 15 20 minutes before actually doing the combined prayer uh the the, the jama uh, and that that's generally the accepted way to do it uh once the light has come in enough to see people's faces this is be if you're outside obviously we have the fluorescent bulbs here you're going to see everyone when you walk in the door um that's when it's considered that the it's the ari time for her soba has ended and then of course this ends when sunrise it actually occurs and that's again a very short window but it is longer window than the mokra uh, for the, the super prayer now there is a minor opinion i just wanted to cover this as well um and it, it's a diff difference in the medheb itself of imam malik um and it's regarding the uh it's the ari and the thorari times uh, and it is that there is no Dorari time for Maghrib and Subah. So the entire window there for Maghrib until Isha comes in, in the minority opinion, uh, is that um, there is no Dorari time. So until Maghrib, from Maghrib until Isha, that entire time, just because it is so short, is fully acceptable and you're not considered late. And then the same thing with Subah, uh, since it is such a shorter time compared to the rest of the Salat uh, times, that that entire window is acceptable and there is no late for that, okay? So, all right. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. We can go into more advanced things, but I kept trying to keep some of that out. Um, if, if you ever take these classes, uh, one, one of the things that they do is, of course, uh, you, you're learning how to read time by a shadow and sticking a, a, a post in the ground or a staff, usually, because that would be the traditional thing. You'd have the Bedouin out caring for the sheep or, or traveling in distance, and he'd have his, his walking stick with him. And that would be what he would use to tell time, just based off of the shadow, subhanAllah. Something I wish we could all learn. <laughs> so the direction of the Qibla is the next thing I wanted to focus on, because uh, this is something that can be confusing as well. There are generally considered to be four different uh, acceptable opinions regarding uh, the direction of the Qibla. And this kind of works in the way of focal points. So think, of course, the Qibla is focusing itself on the Kaaba there at Mecca, right? That's the orientation. So if you take that as your central starting point and work your way out, that, that's kind of where these, uh, think, think rings and circles around that uh, in terms of how these develop. So Ayn Qibla, Qibla, that literally means looking at the Qibla. This is the direction that you, as long as you can see the Kaaba, you can pray. Uh, and that can be any direction. And subhanAllah, uh, it, 
when you're there, it's it's easy to see uh, unless unless you got a building blocking your view, <laughs> pretty much. So, subhanallah. Uh, the next one is the Qibla Kahli. And this is the Qibla from Masjid Nabawi in Medina. That's the direction there. This one's important because <clears throat> actually, who can who can tell me why this one's so important? Was it the first masjid for a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I'm not sure. I think it's, it's, well, it was built for a particular Imam. I forgot. It was the first masjid, and it was the first time where the direction of the Qibla was actually revealed. Okay, yeah. yeah. So before this, um, when the the Muslims were living in Mecca, they were within the Ain Qibla, right? right? And when they were outside of it, they they, they prayed. Um, from what we understand, sometimes they may have prayed towards it. Sometimes they may have prayed towards Jerusalem, actually, instead. Uh, there, there's differences of opinions during that time. What we know from the Quran, of course, in Surah Baqarah, is that the direction of the Qibla was established after the Hijra to Medina. And at that point, the focal point changed from being directly at uh, Moshe Quds, Jerusalem, of course, to the Kaaba. And that's a very important point, which is why the Qibla Tahili is uh, such an important Qibla. Okay? The third one is the Qibla of Cairo. And this was established by Amr bin Alas, who was the general or commander of the army there under uh, Omar, right? Uh, when he went to conquer or fight against the Romans more so, uh, who were persecuting the Muslims. And so as he was conquering Egypt, he was setting up the new capital in Cairo, and he established there at his home a place for his army to pray. And that Qibla is very important because that Qibla isn't pointing directly at the Kaaba. And so this is an interesting matter of fiqh, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. <clears throat> the the last one here is the Qibla Ishtihad. Who can remember what the term Ishtihad means? When uh, someone use their mind to reach uh, a reason. It's independent reasoning. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Right. Good job. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah. So um, Ishtihad in terms of the Qibla is also something that is considered uh, a thing. And that is particularly the case here in North America because we are so far away. We're almost on the other side of the planet from the Kaaba. I mean, we're not going to pray directly at the ground uh, in order to get there. We have to find a direction. And some of that requires us making some ishtihad. And so four of the uh, main ishtihads that you will find are using cardinal directions. That's actually the rationale behind the Qibla in Cairo. It's cardinal directions. Longitudinal directions, uh, that's the one that our message and most messages um, use ever since um, I think it was the mid 90s uh, when Al Azhar issued a fatwa um, recommending that for North America. There is the Kanafis uh, Ishtihad, and that is one that the Ottomans developed particularly. Um, that uh, is actually the rationale behind how most of the masjids in Turkey uh, in the, during the Ottoman Empire were, were formed. And that's using stars navigation to uh, find the Qibla. And then uh, ear to ear. This is the other common one. And this one's actually standardized in, I know, both the Hanafi and the Maliki Madhabs. And that's basically taking your, your ears when you go raise your hands for the takbir. You've got a 45 degree angle on this side, 45 degree angle on this side. Anything in that 90 degree angle, if the Kaaba is in that range, you're good. SubhanAllah. So that's the easiest one. And that's definitely the one that I would recommend uh, when I ask my teachers about this and uh, all the disagreements that can happen uh, here in North America about this. Um, they said, yeah, do, do the earlobe to earlobe one and just call it good because yeah. <laughs> that's the best. Right. SubhanAllah. Like, and you, like you can look that way or you can look that way. That's correct. How, does it matter? 
uh, as long as you are within that range. So our cable is behind me right now. Um, and just I'll just speak broadly here. Within all of the directions, they range from east to north. And you've got there yourself there a direct 90 degree angle. So if you're within that range of east to north, alhamdulillah, you're good. That answer your question? Yep. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right. Um, and this is what I wanted to show here just to explain a little bit. Um, this is just a very rough example of the, the, the Kaaba itself um, with your cardinal directions. So from the from the Kaaba in Mecca, I'm just giving you an example of um, of the Cairo uh, message. Um, what direction is is Cairo from from the Kaaba? Does anyone know? It's on the left. Cairo is in the north. Cairo is northwest, northwest, yeah, yeah, uh, northwest. Uh, Medina is also northwest, uh, and the masjid in Medina faces southeast, almost directly southeast. Um, however, the, the Kaaba there and the masjid in Cairo, those faced almost due east instead of, south, uh, in, instead of southeast or south. They're almost due east. And so that's the important thing there, noting the cardinal directions. The direction for them is closer, just looking east, than it is to the west face. So if you take your, your northern line and just go straight all the way up, and you take your western line and you go straight that direction, the distance is closer from Cairo to hit the northern line than it is to hit the western line. So that's the direction they went with. Makes sense. They're just trying to explain some of the ishtihad uh, that's developed. And subhanAllah, we have centuries, 100 and 1,400 and almost 50 years of Islamic scholarship um, that has just developed over the years. It, we are the ones that develop science of this stuff. I mean, geometry, I, I got to show you this. These are, they don't look that great blown up, but these are... Um, early Ottoman and Syrian manuscripts um, that are discussing geometry and they're all basing it around the Kaaba. SubhanAllah. And, and this is of course happening dur before the Middle Ages, during Europe while well, it's in its so-called Dark Ages, that we're as a Muslim society just developing and really founding the basis of what we have as the Islamic, as the uh, natural sciences today. SubhanAllah. Something that we should just remember and encourage for our children. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All right, so um, the last of the three that I wanted to touch on was covering of the Arwa. Uh, this is important because um, there are multiple types of Arwa. Uh, we have two genders, of course, uh, men and women. So. The way to describe this is that there is a lesser arwa and a greater arwa. The lesser one is like the bare minimum of what has to be covered, and the greater one is what you should be doing when you are in public. That, that's the expected one. Make sense? Um, so for men, the the basic necess the bare necessities is the covering of the two holes. Uh, that is the the, uh, the anus and the urethra. Um, and then the covering between the, the navel and the knees is what's considered the, the greater uh, arwa. And then for women, covering from the legs, that's all the way down to the feet, um, to just under the chest is what's considered the, the lesser, the bare minimum. And then um, covering everything except for the hands, the face, and the soles of the feet in the Maliki Medheb um, is what's considered the greater arwa. Yeah, yeah. So uh, both the the Maliki and the Hanafi permit women to uh, not wear socks, uh, but the distinction is that in the Maliki, the women have to make sure they have a long dress. Uh, the soles of the feet, then, as they're going down into sujud, would be expected to be showing, and that would be okay. It's, it's the distinction there. 
suppose the reason behind that no wearing socks. Of the not wearing socks? Yeah. Um I don't know in the Hanafi, um, and but in the Maliki, it, it's just considered that if they're wearing a long, like jilbab, it, it's going to cover everything. Um, but then when they go down, they could be barefoot and it would be okay. Um, we didn't talk about this when we were talking about wudu and tahara, um, but in some of the other uh, madhabs, there is the permissibility for wearing socks. Mm-hmm. We don't have that uh, in the Maliki Madhab. Socks aren't permitted. Uh, you can't make wudu by wiping over socks or things like no, that. But you have to, if you did, it would have to be leather. And we do have to make sure that that leather is halal leather. Um, that, and that's not something that's easy to find here in the West. Yeah. Um, so that, that would be the reason is because, well, they, they would have made wudu. Right. So they would have had to have some socks off of their feet and shoes off right. and stuff. So, yeah. Uh, clothing uh, is another important thing as we're talking about this, uh, since that's what, we're, what we cover ourselves with, right? Is the clothing. <laughs> uh, so clothing, uh, kind of like as we talked about last week, we, we should make sure that we don't have any najasa, any filth on our clothing. And if there is, uh, and, and the, the dharam, the, the coin, is the size that's usually used, is if it's greater than that size, then you want to wash it off. If it's less than that, then it is permissible. Um, and if sprinkling water is enough, Pure water uh, is enough to to wash it off. Then, alhamdulillah, it's good. If 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 it's too great that sprinkling water on it doesn't clean it, then you would want to change your clothing. Um, pants are generally disliked on men, and, and they would be considered haram for women in the salah, and that comes back to the Quran and what it's talking about for clothing there, uh, for the women last night. Pants. Yes, pants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and then the place of prostration itself should be clean. And, and in the Maliki Metab, it's preferably to be clean at earth. You're supposed to play on the ground, ideally, because that, that's how it was there during the time of the Prophet. Uh, they didn't have these fancy, fancy carpets. And I, there was one of our scholars who was like, oh, you're so luxurious with these carpets. These are a bidda. <laughs> it's a fine well, it's a luxury. It is, and it's a luxury, yeah. I, but... I, you wouldn't call it bitter. That, that's a bit extreme because there are. This is one of the beautiful innovations um, that we have in our, our religion. A bit, a bit of hasana. Um, this actually comes more from the Hanafi madhab using these carpets. Um, so that's something we would actually uh, encourage for that purpose. A lot of these madhab to madhab things are, are just what you find is a this, this personally fits with me. I like this in terms of my temperament and things like that. Yes. Yeah, I have a question related to. Uh, madhab. So yeah, yeah. Should um, the Sunnis and Muslim follow just one madhab, or it's fine to combine? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, every scholar I have talked to has said that you should stick with one madhab, um, and that even the scholars, when they reach the state of having studied and mastered multiple madhabs, they only stick with one. Um, back in these very early times, first couple generations, there might have been liberty because the Medhebs weren't really solidified quite into their schools at that point to kind of jump around and stuff. Um, but if you're actually going to the point of studying to learn these things, then it's wisest to actually just stick with one Medheb. And the reason for that is um, actually for, to have yakin in what you're doing. Because uh, if, you, if you're, you're jumping around between different schools of thought, kind of like when we were talking about in our first class, if, if all you're doing is jumping around between different mas- masalas, you're, you're missing the grander. So for us, us lay students, if we can even call ourselves that, um, it, it, it's definitely recommended to just stick with a, one medhab over another. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Um, on to the salah. So this is the important part. Obligations. Uh, the obligatory acts of the Salah. Uh, these are the Fards only. There are 13 in the Maliki Medheb, and this is generally... No, this is exactly the same in all the Medhebs, uh, these Fards. Uh, the the Nia, the intention. We talked about this a lot last week. The intention is extremely important. Um, and the intention should, in fact, 
the for the Salah itself, um, namely, I'm making the intention for the Dukhar Salah, um, or we're just about to come up to the Isha, right? Uh, I'm, I'm making the intention here to pray the Isha Salah, not another Salah, things like that. And this is important also for when you're going to make up Salah, you should have that intention there as well, is that I'm making up this Salah, it was the, the Fajr because I overslept um, from two weeks ago, etc. Okay? Uh, the takbirat al and that's the Allahu Akbar at the very beginning with the raising of the hand. Uh, uh, the standing for the takbirat, that's the position that one should be in when they're in that, all right? Um, and then the recitation of al Fatiha, Surah al Fatiha. The standing for the recitation of Surah al Fatiha. The raku, the bowing. The rising from the raku, the sujud, the prostration, the rising from the sujud, and then the final sitting before the taslim, that's the tashahud part right there, uh, which is important. And then the taslim, the, uh, <clears throat> and the taslim in the Maliki madhab is distinctly different than in the other madhabs. It is just assalamu alaikum. There's no addition beyond that. Uh, and it's only one taslim as well. That's, that's, yeah, it's probably one of the most known distinctions uh, in the Maliki Madhab. Uh, and that actually comes directly from hadith. If, you, if you're looking into hadith, there's vastly more hadith that only list Assalamu Alaikum as the taslim than there are hadith that mention the full Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa So that, that's where Imam Malik yeah, gets that. Um, calmness in Salah and collectedness in Salah. These are distinct, but they kind of go together. Our Salah is something that we want to have full presence in, right? We want to be fully conscious in it and being nervous, uh, being, being jittery, uh, things like that. that. That's something that's going to keep us out of the calm state. And then the collectedness, just if, we're, if we're, our presence is not there, and we're drifting around in our consciousness, thinking about other things, thinking about what I'm going to eat for my iftar, things like that, right? Um, then, yeah, that's going to void uh, the salam. Uh, so these uh, are important things. Yes? So after the recitation of the Fatha, mm -hmm. reading another, like reading part of the Quran after that, it's not? It's not an obligation. Not an obligation. Not an obligation. Um, and this actually comes from the Quran, uh, is where Imam Malik gets this, because in the, uh, I forget, there's, there's a couple of different places. There's one, there's the ayah about how there, uh, the importance of the seven verses um, for the Salah. And then there's another part, actually this might be from Hadith instead, um, where the the initial prayer of the Prophet was just the Fatiha because he didn't have anything other than the Fatiha to recite. Um, now when we get to, and I'm just going to jump straight there, to the Sunnah Acts, this is where you get the other. Uh, and this is actually important because, um, and I'm going to correct myself here, um, the first prayer of the Prophet had more than just the Fatiha. Um, it would have had a sort of um, sort of alak, the first five ayat from that in it as well, subhanAllah. Um, and maybe surah al-Qalam too, perhaps, um, Allah alam in that. Um, but there are sunnah acts that are important, and I've highlighted the important ones at the top. These are what are called the um, the emphasized, I forget the Arabic term, it's the emphasized sunnahs. These are the ones that the Prophet Sunnah. always did and he never abandoned. And these are actually going to be very important for us to remember as well. They're distinctly sunnahs and not fards, um, but we need to remember these. It's about five or six here, at least at the top. Six, yeah. And these are the recitations of a chapter of the Quran after the Fatiha, just what you're talking about. Uh, and that's in the first and second raqqa. Standing for the recitation of the Quran, silently, uh, re reciting silently what is to be recited silently 
and reciting aloud what is to be recited aloud. And that's, of course, reference to during the Dukr and the Asr we recite silently, whereas during the Subbah, the Isha, and the Maghrib, um, we recite out loud. But not in the third and the fourth Raqqa, right? Um, all of the Takbara are Sunnah, except for the first Takbar, which is the Fard, that we talked about earlier. Um, saying Assalam, <coughs> sorry, uh, saying Sami Allahu Luman Hamida for the Imam and the one performing the Salat alone as well. Um, so those are the things that are the Sunnah, uh, Sunnah Muakaba, right? Muakada. Uh, Sunnah Muakada, yes, right, yeah. Um, the ones that the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he always did with the Salat. Um, other Sunnahs that are important. So remember the first sitting, the elongating of the second sitting before the taslim, returning the salam to the imam, similar returning the salam to the left side if there was someone there, a sutra, that's a barrier, um, for the imam, and then also a sutra for a person praying alone if they fear that someone may walk in front of them. Okay? So in the Being Muslim book, just a second. Um, there are some excellent diagrams, and I included these, which are in the translation of the uh, Matnash Mawiyah, the Arabic text, um, just to briefly go over. Uh, and we'll review these real quick, and then I'll get to your question, okay? Um, so step one, showing the intention here. Then step two, raising the hands for the takbir. The, uh, the standing, qiyam, right? And an important thing also, I'll just briefly mention, um, as you, you might have noticed here, we didn't talk about hand positions at all uh, in the uh, sunnahs or in the fards. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even think they're in the recommended on the Maliki. Um, but the dominant opinion of the Maliki Madhab is the position that's called the sadl, which is the hands at the side. And that comes from two hadiths of the Prophet uh, and the Tabi'in, actually, um, where um, they said that the proper prayer of the Prophet was that after the takbir, he let his hands drop until all his bones were in stillness. Um, the ruku, the next step, right, uh, after we've finished our recitations, uh, and then standing again, and then going down into prostration, then the the sitting and then the second prostration and then you would go back and uh, as it says <clears throat> you'd go back and repeat uh the standings for of course your second rakah third rakah fourth rakah um uh, and then of course on the second and fourths or th thirds or fourths you would have the the final sitting um and then of course the close and fixing all right yes brother yeah, I was about to ask about like w when you are uh, in your ruku or sujood, yeah. sometimes, uh, not sometimes, but we say like Allah or something mm -hmm. like that. Is that something sunnah or? Um, it, it's not included in the sunnahs. It's in the recommended or the permissible acts. Oh, okay. Yeah, and and there's you know there's a famous um, story uh, of the prophet and the companions, alayhi salatu salam, um, where. The prophet was leading the prayer, and um, you know after the Sami'ah Liman Hamida, then the individuals often say Rabbana wa laka hamd, and one of the companions added to that some phrases of praise and glorification, magnification of Allah. And after the salah, the prophet turns to the congregation, and his companions, and he says. Who was it that added such and such? And he said it, because even though they'd said it quietly. And the companion's shy because he's like, oh, I'm just about to get called out by the Prophet. <laughs> so I'm here and get in trouble because I, I just did a bidah. I, I created my own innovation, right? And the Prophet turns to this brother and says, what you did was a beautiful thing because the angels who were present just flocked around you and were loving you Aww. when you said that. So when th this is an encouragement for things like that, and that during the prayer, um, we can add our own du'a, our own supplications, 
Uh, obviously, the ones that the uh, the scholars and the companions and all have have passed down to us are ones that we should favor because these are ones that we know are favored by Allah uh, and by the angels, right? Um, but particularly when you're down in prostration, when you're in ruku, um, even when you're in the tashadud, at the end of that, after if you want to make more du'a, things like that, then by all means, these are excellent times and perhaps even the best time uh, for making supplications, asking for forgiveness, and things like that. Uh, it, the the being Muslim book doesn't have this, but in the translation here um, uh, of the Matnash Mawiyah, it, it gives the written text, of course, like it does in the being Muslim for the Tashadud and all of the other things that are said. And then it goes on and there's an entire page here of other things that um, are permissible to be said in supplication. Some of these are ones that we would normally have, prayers upon the Prophet, upon the companions, upon the family of Ibrahim, which is a beautiful thing because if you think about it, we're praying upon the families of Ibrahim and the followers of Ibrahim. This is a dua that we're making for the Jews and the Christians in five times a day, at least, right? <laughs> SubhanAllah, uh, just, just an amazing thing. We, you, you don't see Christians and Jews going around praying for Muslims, but you see us doing it all the time. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. Um, but yeah, there's an entire page here of just different du'as. Um, probably the most famous of them, of course, is um, the is it the last two verses, I believe, of Surah Al-Baqarah, um, in, in terms of asking for protections uh, from hellfire and things like that. Um, and there's a lot of du'as that are based off of that, too, and that are very similar. So all of these are permissible things, but they're not considered fards, they're not considered sunnas. Um, being that, that the Prophet didn't do them regularly enough or proclaim that he was doing them or order them to be done um, to make them something that's required for the prayer itself to be valid. Okay? Alhamdulillah. All right. Um, some complications that can happen in Salah, and it's important to cover this because things happen in life. And one of those is getting older. Um, we have brothers and sisters that have to use the chairs. Um, sitting and lying down is a permitted thing uh, for those, and it's for only those um, who have mobility issues. Um, so this is important, and um, I know we could probably actually use a few more chairs, I think, on the brother's side. So um, something to keep in mind that we want to make sure that if we're coming to the masjid and the masjid is full and we aren't one who need to use a chair, and we should reserve that for someone who does need it because there are members in our community who do have mobility issues and they need these in order to make their obligatory prayers. Um, shortening and combining prayers is something that is permitted when traveling. So the prayers that can be shortened are the Duhr, the Asr, and the Isha. These are the prayers that are of uh, four rakah, four units in length, and they can be shortened and cut in half. In two. So the last two you can leave off, uh, and that is permitted if you are traveling. A travel is generally considered to be a distance of 33 miles or greater, and once you reach a location, um, if you're going to be in that location longer than approximately four days, 20 prayers, uh, then you, you should go back to praying and not consider yourself a traveler anymore. Uh, but if you're within that time and if you're traveling from one location to another and you're staying only three to four days or less, uh, then you would be fine to be combining your prayers for the entirety of that. Uh, sorry, for shortening the prayers. Combining the prayers would be Duhr and Asr may be combined and Maghrib and Isha may be combined. And this is only during that travel time. So once you reach your destination, you would want to go back to praying them in their specific times. But when you are traveling, you can combine by either delaying the Dukhr till the Asr time and praying them together, delaying the Maghrib to the Isha time and praying them together, or the Malakims <coughs> do permit you to bring them forward. I believe the Shafi'is also permit that as well. Um, that you could then bring Asr forward if you knew that you would be traveling until you reached Maghrib for that entire point. Um, otherwise, that wouldn't be permitted to bring it forward. And then same thing again for Maghrib. If you knew that, okay, Maghrib's come in, I'm going to be traveling pretty much all night until maybe even I take a break for, for Subba, right? Uh, then it would be permissible 
for combining and bringing Isha forward. Something to think about is that this is actually a wisdom that we would be probably using more during our age today than the companions of the past would have ever even considered. And the reason for that is airplane travel. Airplane travel means that you're going to be in a place traveling for a long period of time and you're not going to have access to a prayer space, perhaps. You might be locked in your seat, which then isn't permissible if you are uh, not with a mobility issue, right? Um, so, panel, we have some airlines like Emirates Airlines, uh, there's some, I think, Turkish Airlines. Uh, I don't know if Egypt Air has it or not, um, where they actually have a prayer space on board the plane for those um, who, who need to pray. But not all airlines do that. Um, definitely not the majority ones here in this country. Um, so having the ability to bring forward the times or delay the times a bit, this is a, one of those mercies upon us, right? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, yeah. So on an airplane, which direction of the cup? Uh, uh, yeah, the yeah. That, again, one of those times where you're going to want to use the ishtihad of um, where you're at in the world um, and then... I'm going to give you the, the earlobe to earlobe. You've got your 45s on each side, total of 90 degrees. If you're in that range, based off of your understanding of where you are in the plane, and the plane's giving you a place to pray in there, alhamdulillah, if, if they're giving you a place to play in there, the plane probably is going to have an idea of where your Qibla is too. I'm, I'm going to assume. Um, I know of at least two airlines that have that. Uh, they'll have a Qibla compass that navigates in their prayer, plane prayer room uh, as it's going wrong. Both Saudi and Emirates, I believe, have that. That's my understanding. So, um, inshallah, that, that would be what you'd want to do, is take that 90-degree window, and you'll be as close as you can since you don't know precisely. You're probably looking out the window, and it's all clouds. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but alhamdulillah, you get a praise to play. May Allah reward that. And accept it, inshallah. Um, and then lastly, complications of making up prayers. These happen. Um, and then that is, of course, an obligatory thing to, to make up missed prayers. Uh, while I'm talking about the missed prayers, um, just as a reminder, a lot of these things that I mentioned, some of it may seem, especially for someone who's new, oh, this is a lot to take in, a lot i got to remember. And I, I've got to, even for someone who's just coming into Islam, figure out how to fit in the prayers into my schedule and get this routine down and... You find that you're constantly missing or delaying a prayer, things like that. If some of these issues in terms of like, um, particularly the ones in terms of like the clothing things, if, if you're struggling to get your things together um, for, the, for the prayer, yeah. it's better to just go and do the prayer than to delay it. If that's always the favorite opinion. Um, I, I was reading through some of the stuff in terms of like, cleaning the prayer space, having clean clothes on and things like that, and getting yourself to it. Like if you can't get your, if you're, if you're waking up at night and uh, this is something that could happen like during Ramadan, right? We, we have our iftar and then we pass out and maybe we passed out before Isha came in. We didn't pray Isha. And then we wake up and it's now, maybe we missed Isha even. And it's almost sunrise. We're barely going to try to, catch the subah prayer it's better to throw something around you real quick so you've got something covering you and try to make that prayer if you can make a tiamum or something like that we covered last week get that prayer in so you don't miss two prayers in a row to get that done that, that is going to be a better thing to do than to not do it at all alhamdulillah may, again may Allah forgive us and may Allah reward us for what we do inshallah so mistakes in salah again these can occur and there's two different types, um, through omission and through addition. Um, not common, but this is something for myself, I, I witnessed first, of course, probably during Tarawih. Um, it happens to anyone who's, who's reciting from time to time again, that they'll, they'll realize that they missed something in their Salah. Uh, and again, this can be from either omission or from uh, addition. Uh, the importance here to note is that... Um, to make toba basically in the prayer to rectify that prayer if you've caught that you made your mistake then you would make a two sajda um with the allahu akbar is going down allahu akbar up allahu akbar down two sajdas performed before the taslim 
when there is an emphasized sunnah. That's why I highlighted those emphasized sunnahs for us earlier. When there's an emphasized sunnah that has been omitted, these sashas are then accompanied by another tashadud and a taslim. If there is an addition that has occurred, maybe you made three rakahs when it was supposed to only be two, okay? Um, then one prostrates after the taslim. <clears throat> if one omits and adds, then one does a prostration before taslim because omission supersedes addition. Okay? And this can be a bit confusing, and um, it, if, if you mess up in, in that, then just the easiest thing to do, of course, is just to repeat the whole prayer. But if you are catching yourself and you can understand what to do, then these are ways that you can correct so that you don't have to make up a prayer. Okay? Um, forgetfulness is of three types in general. Missing a fard, which does entirely invalidate the salah. You will have to make that one up. Missing a fadila, and that's a recommended thing. So it's not a sunnah, it's in a muakata uh, or a fard. And so no uh, sujud sahli is required. Um, that's perfectly fine. Your, your slot is still valid. And then missing, it's that missing the sunnah, and it is the recommended sunnahs um, by omission or addition. And that's where these would come in. Okay? Um, there's a lot of details, and honestly, the, the books of fiqh spend pages talking about these and how to do them and all of the different reasons why one might occur and things like that and it's way more than we have time for <clears throat> mistakes in salah briefly i'll cover these the sujud sahwi is oh sorry no down to the bottom uh if one does not know whether they have prayed two or three rakah then the recommendations of scholars is that the minimum rakah which they think was missed should be added uh, whether that's an addition then or not. Uh, and if one still doubts, then you would add the um, uh, uh, the, the Sashu Sahwi. Uh, and that would be permissible. Yeah, <laughs> alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I'm prepared. So conditions for leading the Salah uh, for the Imamah. The Imam must be a Mukhalif. And we covered that already, right? He must be one who has received the dawah, must be of age of puberty, and must be sane. Uh, the imam must be a male, not a female. There is an opinion in the Shafi'i Madhab. I'll just mention this because this has actually been recommended by a lot of Maliki scholars here in the West. Is that um, the, the Shafi'i opinion is that if there are women in a congregation of just women, then a woman can be the imam. Or just the women but if that was a congregation that's mixed and there's children that were males things like that then no it has to be purely women um so you, women can lead prayer for women women can lead prayer for women and it's that that is a thing that is in the shafi medheb and the maliki scholars here in the west generally recommend just to go suppose, with that opinion suppose they are all women and two men then one of the men would be the one who has to lead right. yeah mm-hmm um, the Imam must be knowledgeable in both Tajweed and Fiqh regarding what invalidates Salah so that if they make a mistake, they know how to correct it, okay, to keep it valid for everyone. Um, the Imam must not be a Kafir, a disbeliever. He must be a Muslim. <laughs> um, the Imam must not be disobedient or unmindful sinner. He must be a good Muslim. Or one who is at least repenting. Or practicing Muslim. Right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah practicing Muslim. And the Imam must not be intentionally impure. And the intentional part is the in, in thing there. He must not be intentionally impure. Okay? Who should be Imam? This is always a question we have, right? <laughs> um, this is a, kind of just a generic breakdown that the scholars give. The, the top is the Khalifa, the Sultan, something we actually don't have anymore in Islam. It happened for a hundred years now. Uh, SubhanAllah. The owner of the home then has the highest priority. And then the landlord, the one who is the caretaker the, of the property, um, the king or the governor then comes next. Then the one who is most knowledgeable in fiqh. And then the one who is most knowledgeable in hadith. And then the one who is most knowledgeable in tajweed and Quran. And then the one who is most 
uh, is known for the most ibadah, followed by the one who has been in Islam longest, or the one who is the most noble lineage, or the one who is of the best character. Okay? However, the one most capable for Imam should lead because competence prevails over rank or status. And this is something that you will see um, when you have a group of these people together. And it's hard to find. Ooh, yeah, but, uh, it, it, it's hard to find someone who has the best of character even yeah, sometimes. Yeah. And when you have a room full of these people, you will see that none of them volunteer to be the imam. No. And in fact, when one of them says, oh, go be the imam, that person will be like, oh, no, 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 he should go do it instead. <laughs> they will all defer. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. Um, which is why the one who is most capable in the situation uh, should step up and lead uh, because competence is like that, what prevails over uh, the rank and stuff. Okay? Um, obligations for the Juma. Because again, this is a obligatory thing. Uh, Juma is obligatory upon the Mukhalif, who is a free male. That's something in our society um, that is, is everyone. Um, back in the times where there were, uh, there were slaves, um, slave men um, were not required to attend. Uh, just, it was just a free, free man's thing. Uh, one who is, of course, a Muslim, one who is a resident of the community, and one who is of good health. These are the what makes it obligatory upon you to attend the Juma. Mm -hmm. if, if you are missing in one of those categories, then Juma is not obligatory. It's okay? kind of for Salah. It is kind of for Salah. And I'm just about done. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm almost done here. I'll be very quick. Uh, the conditions of validity um, for the, the Juma are uh, the Juma must take place at a masjid which observes regular Salah. Um, the Juma, the, uh, the Jama, the group, um, the size doesn't really have a limit, preferably numbers 12. Some of the other methods do limit, they do specify a number, uh, but in the Maliki we don't specify a particular limit. Um, the first khutbah um, must be done, and that's before the imam um, sits down and, and the congregation makes a safar, things like that. But that first khutbah is a requirement. Uh, any number addition to that, there is no limit. Uh, the imam can come up and speak and then he can sit down again. He can come up and speak and he can sit down again. If it, there's no limit. If the community wants to break and have two jumas, um, then perhaps they could do that. Uh, that that's actually a different topic. Um, Wudu is recommended at all times during the khutbah for all congregants, uh, and it is obligatory on the imam um, to always stand when he's giving the khutbah, not to sit. Uh, an imam who leads, who meets the conditions of the imam, uh, is required uh, for a juma. Uh, the same person can lead the khutbah, should lead the salah, except when an excuse prevents him. And it is compulsory to wait in case of a delay. And an important note that I observed and I was actually going through this was that someone who is traveling, who is a traveler, doesn't meet the obligatory conditions for being it. And, and this is actually important because often our communities talk about bringing in a guest for uh, giving the, the Jum Khutbah, right? Well, it's actually not required on that guest to do it. it, it that's a, actually a big honor. So um, when we have visitors like that, for one, it's something that we should just be aware of is that they're doing something that is completely not obligatory for them. They're, they're traveling who knows how long, taking all this time and energy. It's a, it's a, it's a physical and emotional taxing thing, probably. This is something that we should honor and we should reward them specifically for this. And in, in our time showing up and attending these things, um, perhaps financially with a, ch a charity of the Sadaqa and all sorts of things like that, providing them with as much housing and support on their way. And honorariums for such people is something that would be very much encouraged because of, of this high uh, honor that they're coming into when it is not an obligatory thing for them to do. And then the last um, condition of validity is having a residential area. Um, Juma isn't required necessarily in the countryside, things like that. 
Alhamdulillah, we're in a city that has, I think, nine different masjids in it. So wherever you go in the neighborhoods, even in Portland, you will find a masjid. And that's such a beautiful thing. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Prohibitions for the Juma. It's prohibited to travel during the midday of the Juma. Um, <clears throat> it's. I'm just going to turn this down because we're going to try to finish this and enjoy them, inshallah. Um, it's prohibited to travel during the midday if Juma is obligatory upon you. So if you meet the obligation or criteria for participating in the Juma, then you should not be traveling. That, that would actually be incurring a sin upon you to travel during that midday time of the Juma. Uh, it's haram to speak or perform nawafal uh, d- while the Imam is giving khutbah. And this is a Maliki perspective. It's not the same in all of the other madhabs. So do give some grace for it, but something to consider. Um, we should be present in the sul- in, in the khutbah. We should be listening to the imam. Um, it's a, a duty upon us to him, and his duty is to, of course, give us a good reminder and important information. Buying and selling is haram during the time uh, of the ikama and should be avoided before that, when uh, from the time of the adan onwards as well. And you'll find this really well in Muslim countries that all of the street vendors and stuff, when they have the Adhan going on, oh, they, they stop and they, they close down, or they, at least they hush up a bit, which is good. Let's pause for prayer. Um, and I will pause the recording and stop the recording at this point, because um, the rest of this is just some, some beneficial things and reminders for us. We've covered all the fards at this point, um, so do please come back if you can uh, after the Salah. And uh, we'll just continue with a couple other things, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.